Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 7, getting right into it, says there in verse 1, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them uh, from uh, before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. So right out of the gate, you know, God's telling them, hey, this is how you're going to uh, handle these people when you get there. And it's not a very, uh, and he says, you know, make no covenant. What does he mean by that? He says, there's not going to be any peace agreement. You know, you're not going to spare these people. He wants them utterly wiped out. That was God's intention. Now, did that happen? No, we know that they left uh, some of them there. And then the Bible says that they were a thorn in their side all their, uh, all their days. And in fact, that's probably what led a lot of them astray later. Uh, when they continue to have these false gods around. But we see that this is how, what God wanted done when they went into this land with these people, is that he said, no covenant with them, make no peace agreements. And of course, uh, it didn't take very long where they, uh, that they failed at this. You know? And if you would, turn over to Joshua chapter 9. Uh, it'll be a familiar story for many of us, but perhaps not to others. And we'll take a look at it here. You know, God said when you go in there that he didn't want you making any kind of covenant. You were to show no, uh, no mercy unto them that they were to just take them out. And it wasn't very long that they were in the land at all before this uh, commandment was broken. And you see that in Joshua chapter 9, verse 1, where it says, And it came to pass, when all the kings which were on this side, Jordan, and the hills, and in the valleys, and the coast of the great sea, over against Lebanon, the Hittite, and the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, does that sound familiar? Uh, heard thereof, okay, so they've come over to Jordan, and they've uh, they come over to Jordan, into their land, and they've heard of this that they gathered uh, themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done it to Jericho and to Ai, they did work willingly and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sack, uh, sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet and old garments with them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp of Gilgal and said unto him, unto the men of Israel, We be come from a far country, now, therefore, make ye a league with us. And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, verse 7, he said, and, and, and the men of Israel said uh, unto the Hivites, Hivites, Peradventure, pre adventure, uh, ye dwell among us, how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence came ye? So you got to remember, or from whence come ye. He said, God doesn't say wipe you know, every single person out. He's, he's very specific. He says, these seven nations, that's what we read there in Deuteronomy. This is why Joshua begins his line of inquiry. Where he starts to ask, okay, well, who are you? you know, before we go make any league with you, you know, we want to know who you are. And of course, they, these guys, uh, the inhabitants of Gibeon, they're being deceptive, right? And when, the, and when they said to Joshua, we are thy servants. And Joshua said to him, who are you and from, wh uh, from whence come ye? Verse 9, and they said unto him, from a very far country. Now, that should be right there. You know, if you knew a little bit about statement analysis, you know when they put the word very in there, they, you know, they're trying to overemphasize. We're from a very, not just, hey, we're from a far country. No, we're from a very far country. You know, like, it's certainly not any of these nations that you've been commanded to wipe out. It's not any of those. No, no, it's from a very far country. You know, how far is it? Oh, it's very far away. They didn't say what country, you know, so that's something that you can always look at when you see people emphasizing things where they put overemphasis on it. They're probably trying to deceive you. So he says, we're from a very far country. Thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. We have, and that's not at all the case, is it? These guys are just trying to save their skins. You know, they're just trying to get out of this thing alive. They know that God's coming down on this, the inhabitants of this land, that they're going to get wiped out. So they're going about this you know, and trying to uh, make sure that they're not going to you know, get taken out. He says, for we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore, the elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals and, and, and with you for a journey, to, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are thy servants, therefore uh, now make ye a league with us. Now, this should have struck Joshua as a little odd. This is straight, doesn't this sound a little odd to you? That here you are, you're, you're from a very far country. You know, if you're from a very far country, then you're not even, uh, they're not even a threat to you. Right? The, the, the evidence of Israel, the children of Israel weren't even a, being a threat to them. And now you have a king telling you to go make yourself their servants? It's just kind of a strange story. I mean, Joshua, I, I, sometimes it, you know, might, you know, Joshua, you know, is a guy in the Bible, one of the few characters in the Bible you see just doesn't do anything wrong. 
you know, and, and here's like one of the, the only instance that you can really think of where he kind of gets things a little backwards. And it's really not even necessarily entirely his fault. He's kind of just being deceived here. And he goes and he says, and uh, <coughs> we've heard all of it, you know, verse 11, and, and uh, wherefore, uh, verse 11, they, they say, go, you know, make, make ye league with us. This is our bread, but we took hot of our, for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. Well, this is the evidence, see? <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not your, your neighbors here. Uh, and these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these old garments and our shoes are become old by reason the very long journey. How long is that journey? Oh, it's very long. It's a very far country. And the men of, his, uh, of, uh, of their, uh, and the men took of their victuals and asked and not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And that's where they went wrong, wasn't it? Because they did not ask counsel at the mouth of the Lord. You know, maybe they'd gone and said, hey, Lord, who are these people? They said, yeah, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Take them out. Right? But they didn't do that. And what happens in verse, first fif verse 15? And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And these were people that God wanted destroyed. And he goes ahead and, he, and he's deceived. You know, and these people come to him. He gets, he gets deceived. Not his credit. You know, Joshua defend him a little bit because he's a great man of God. Uh, they were, these people were lying. You know, they were being very deceptive. And here's the thing, though, when, when they are finally discovered here in verse 16, where it picks up, it says, And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made a league with them, that they heard that their neighbors, uh, they were their neighbors, and that they dwelt among them. So now the truth comes out not very long after, I mean, just three days later. I mean, it's such a short time frame, you might say, oh, well, it's so, such a short time frame, you know, go ahead and wipe them out now. It's not like years have gone by, it's just three days. He says, <laughs> he says uh, and the children of Israel journeyed, and they came unto the, uh, to their cities the, the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Chephira and Beeroth and Kerjath Jerim. And the children of Israel smote them not because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And the congregation murmured against the princes. But the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord of Israel. Now therefore we must not touch them. And then of course it goes on and talks about how they're going to make them the hewers of wood, and, the, and they, were, they were to bring water and wood to the house of God. That's what he made. They, they were brought in to, to be servants in the house of the Lord, to bas basically be what we would call you know, slaves today. They were, they were made to serve with hard labor in the house of God because of their deception, right? But what's important to notice here, and if you would turn over to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, is that, you know, yeah, these people lied, didn't they? These people lied. They deceived Joshua and the people into thinking them, making them think that they were somebody they weren't. And the truth comes out, you know, fairly quickly. You know, humanly speaking, we could step back and say, well, you know, it's only been three days. I mean, go ahead and, and take care of business. Do what you need to do here. But you notice the princes and Joshua, they're very careful not to break this vow. And that's something that we need to learn from the story is that when you make a vow, you need to keep it. You know, and that's why Jesus said, if you look here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, he said, uh, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said of them of old time, Thou shalt, perf uh, thou shalt uh, not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform the Lord thine oaths. And he said, But I say unto you, swear not at all. So, you know, if you do make a vow, you better keep it. But you know what's better than making a vow is to not make a vow at all. Right. It's to not even make that swear, not even to make that oath to begin with. Because that's how serious God takes the breaking of vows. Now there are, you know, we do, we do, uh, we, we do take, uh, you know, marriage vows, right? We do, we do, you know, and that's a, that's a whole other subject in itself. But here's the thing: when you're when you're pledging yourself to another person, you're not swearing to God or anything like that. You're pledging yourself to this other person. You should take that seriously. That's something that has to be kept, you know. And, and it's better not to swear at all. It's better to just not swear at all than to make an oath and then break it. And that's what you learn from the story here, back when Joshua is that when they made that vow, yeah, you know what? It had only been three days. And the only reason they made that vow was because that they thought they were somebody else. And, it's, and we, humanly speaking, say it should have been all right. They should have just gone ahead and break the vow and take care of them and just wiped them out like God wanted. But they understood something that a lot of us need to understand today and now is that when you make a vow, when you, when you swear something, you better keep it because God takes it seriously. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's better just not swear at all. <laughs> it's better to just not make that oath if you don't think you can keep it. Just don't even open your mouth. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. <coughs> so he's, now if you would, keep something in the New Testament. We're going to be coming back to the several places in the New Testament tonight. So just go ahead and keep something there. 
But go back to Deuteronomy chapter 2. So you see the first thing that God wanted them to do when they go into this land is he said, uh, you know, you shall make no covenant with them and nor show mercy unto them, right? You know, mercy is for the weak. You know, you must show your enemy no mercy, right? No, and nobody's gets in these references. That's probably a good thing. But in verse 3 it says, uh, in verse, uh, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. You know, speaking of vows, you know, speaking of making a covenant, and neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his uh, daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So God, he says there, look, first of all, I don't want you to show any mercy unto them. And you say, well, that's not very nice. Why wouldn't God want to show mercy? And isn't God merciful? Of course he is. But God is also very just. You know, God is a God of justice. <clears throat> and the Bible says he is by no means clearing the guilty. And, you know, if, I know we're going we're gonna to turn it several pages tonight, so just be, be ready to turn. But go to Leviticus chapter 18. I know we looked at this when we first got into this, uh, this book, but I want us to remember uh, uh, th what it is that, that um, the type of people that they're dealing with here. <sighs> I'm getting all mixed up. Leviticus chapter 18. We looked at this when we first started Deuteronomy, but it's good to have a reminder because we're going to see that they destroy these people. And you come across verses like this all the time and they're saying, look, wipe them out. Show no mercy to these people. No, no peace. No peace treaties. Uh, you know, no negotiations. Wipe them out. That's what God wants. And people want to throw their arms up and say, well, that's not, you know, how dare God, you know, and shake their fist at God. But let's remember who it is that we're dealing with. Now, if you read Leviticus 18, we're not going to take the whole time to read this for sake of time, but it talks about all of the abominations that these people were involved in. I mean, bestiality, sodomy, incest, the, the, the most wicked, vile sins. Sins that only a reprobate people could be, take part in. Sins that are unnatural to man. These are, these are, that's what you're dealing with when you're talking about these nations. Reprobates. Haters of God. And he says here... Uh, in Leviticus 18, look at verse 24. He says, Defile ye not in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. He said, look, they did all these things. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. So it's not that just God is picking on these people. He's visiting their own iniquity upon them. And he says, uh, thereof, And the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. I mean, Talk about colorful language in the Bible, right? The way God just describes this. The land is so defiled, it just, it's making the land itself vomit them out. That's how disgusting and vile these people are. Say, so how can you say that? Well, look at the things that they were involved in. I mean, get, go ahead, back up. Go home to, and read Leviticus 18 tonight, if you, if you haven't read it. And read what it is that they're involved in. <coughs> you know, they're, they're offering their children in the fire to Molech. Wicked people. <coughs> and he says, look, ye, in verse 26, Ye therefore shall uh, keep my statutes and my judgments, and it shall not commit any of these abominations. That's what he calls them, abominations. Things that God hates, things that God detests. That's what these people are involved in. So what we have to understand here, what God's saying, look, go in there, show no mercy unto them, make no covenant with them, don't give your daughters unto them, don't take their daughters unto you. It's because these are wicked nations that God is dealing with at this time. These are wicked nations that deserve to be punished. And God is visiting their own iniquity upon their heads. Go ahead and, back and turn back to Deuteronomy. And we'll, we'll continue on there in verse 3 where it says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. And this is, you know, again, this is a really good, important principle for us to learn. And we talked about this in the sermon a few weeks ago. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, Stranger Danger was, was the name of it. If you haven't heard it, listen to that one online. But he says, you know, he's showing us again, you know, we're not to be marrying the heathen. That's something that God's people should be avoiding, and for very good reasons. And, you know, we talked about in that sermon I preached about, you know, we use King Solomon as an example, right? As somebody, you know, who even had seen God appeared unto him twice and spoken to him. I mean, he heard God. And, and he, I mean, he, he had such, and yet in his old age, when he, and he got on in years, his heart was turned and he's worshiping idols. And he's worshiping all these demonic gods because of his strange wives. Now, what a strange wise. Foreigners to Israel, they were not believers in the Lord. These were heathen people that turned their heart. That's what it's saying there in Deuteronomy, that they, would, they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. That's exactly what we saw happen to a man as great as King Solomon. But we think, oh, but we're better than that. 
Oh, really? Has the Lord appeared unto you twice? And talked to you? And told you personally things? No, He didn't. Did God? Did He give you wisdom and riches and honor? Has He done that for you? And yet we're... Yeah, we, oh, we just think, well, I can change Him. I can change her. You know, I'm sure it's out there, but do you really want to roll the dice on that? And, and, you know, and see if that is going to work out? Why not just trust God? Why not just follow what He says here? And I don't want to go on and on about this, but, you know, verse... Uh, <coughs> You know, and another, we talked about Solomon, but, you know, and here's another, to kind of, you know, extrapolate on this, think about this. King David did the same thing as, as Solomon in regards to having, he multiplied wives as well, didn't he? That's right. But you know what? He didn't have strange wives. And his heart didn't turn away from following the Lord God. You know, he didn't end necessarily in the worst way. Now, he did some bad things in his life. But, you know, and, and another thing to think about is the fact, you know, King David is a guy, when you look at the beginnings of, of his life, you know, he went through a lot of hardships. He went through a lot of trials, didn't he? <coughs> I mean, he's running from Saul. He's living in the mountains. He's, he's trying to save his own neck, you know, literally. He's trying to not die, get killed by Saul. And uh, he's out there in the woods for years. He's having to go live in the Philistines. You know, he's feeling persecuted. He's writing all these, you know, psalms, just expressing, you know, and lamenting his position. He went through a lot before he came king, before, before he was established and prospered. He suffered a lot of things. You know, I think that probably draw, brought him a lot closer to God. And he... That's probably why maybe he, did, maybe he did some things that were wrong, of course, but he didn't go as far as, as Solomon did in marrying strange wives. And if you look at Solomon, he was one that just kind of had it all handed to him, didn't he? It all just kind of fell into his lap. There was no struggle. There was no suffering that he had to go through. So that's something to think about, too, in that story. And, and uh, you know, <coughs> but the, real, the purpose of, of all this is found in verses 4 and 5. The why behind it. Why is it that God is saying, look, don't make peace with them. Don't make a covenant with them. Don't take, give and take in marriage with these people because of verse 4. For they will turn away thy son from following me. And, it's, and, and that they may serve other gods. And they go, well, that's not, you know, okay, what's the worst that's going to happen is they're going to quit serving the Lord. You know, if I marry this heathen unbeliever, the worst that could happen is, you know, we stop going to church. You know, we don't raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, something, life isn't going to be what it could be. A actually, it's worse than that. Keep reading because it says... Uh, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and <laughs> destroy thee suddenly. You know, that will actually kinder God, kindle God's anger when he sees God's people going and marrying heathens when they know they shouldn't. Now, some things are done in ignorance and we still suffer the consequences. But if, you know, unto whom much is given shall, also much be, shall much also be required. You know, if we understand this concept and this principle and we've been warned and we go ahead and say, well, you know, I know better than God and we go out and do that. We're going to suffer the consequences, and you know what? You might even kindle the wrath of God. And I'm not saying he's going to wipe you out suddenly like here. I mean, this is a pretty you know, unique situation, but it's a principle in Scripture that we can learn from. That if we want God's blessing in life, you know, we should probably marry people that believe like we do and have the same principles that we do. But again, I preached a whole sermon on that. I don't want to go on and on about that tonight. But it is in the, in the text, so we had to talk about it. Now, go on there in verse, is, uh, verses 6 and 7 where it says... It says in verse 6, uh, <clears throat> we'll pick it up in verse 5, but thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. And he says, destroy it, get rid of it. You know, God's not like, you know, set up your own thing, but keep their stuff for, mem you know, memorabilia. Put it in the Smithsonian so we can admire it from years ago. This was the ancient civilization. So, you know, God's like, no, get rid of it. We don't even want them to be remembered on the earth. Yeah. They're that wicked. Just get them off of here. <coughs> Let them be just, their, their, their remembrance be blotted out from under heaven. <coughs> he says in verse 6, Why? Why do all this? For thou art an holy people in the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people <coughs> unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the, or, of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were in more number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. So these are interesting verses. Whenever, you come, whenever I read these, this always makes me stop and think about, you know, just about the story. I mean, God didn't choose these people because of who they were. You know, God chose them because of the covenant he'd made with their fathers. You know, he was keeping his word that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's like saying, look, you know, you are a special people unto me. You know, you are very, if you would turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he's saying, Look, you know, you are special people. You're a holy people. 
You're a peculiar people, is what we read in the in the in the New Testament regarding uh, the New Testament saints, and uh, <coughs> and God's saying, look, you know, and it's not because you're all that. <laughs> and, you know, God didn't get a bargain when He got the children of Israel. And newsflash, God didn't get a bargain when He got me and you. You know, it cost Him dearly, right? And and, and we're not God's gift to whatever. You know, and that's what He's trying to get across here. He says, look, you are my people. And I want you to, to, to do my, uh, follow me and keep my commandments. You know, you're special, you're holy, you're peculiar. But don't think it's because of who you are that, you're that, that I've made you this. You know, I did this for your sake. Look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll look at verses uh, 6 through 7. It says, For I say unto you, through the, the grace that is given unto me, to every man. Now, let this, let, just right there, that first statement, think about this. Paul says, for I say. So Paul's speaking with authority here. He's saying, look, it's me that's saying this. I say this, for I say. But he, notice what he does in the, right, right after that, through the grace that is given unto me. So he's not saying, you, you know, he, yeah, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's putting himself out there as an authority, but he's also backing that authority up by saying, and it's only because of the grace that is given unto me through God. Through the grace that is given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think. <clears throat> so in the beginning, you know, Paul's e e exemplifying that. He's saying, look, I don't think more highly than I, than I ought to think. You know, yeah, I say this, but it's through the grace that's given unto me. You see what I'm saying? You see, you follow me here? And he says, to every man that is among you, not to think more highly than he ought to think. And that's really what the children of Israel are being told in Deuteronomy chapter 7. He's saying, look, you know, don't think it's because you were the greatest of people that I chose you. I chose you because you were the fewest of and you're the, you're the smallest. I mean, think about the position they were in when God found them. Slaves in Egypt, under hard bondage. Try, Pharaoh's trying to wipe them out, telling them to kill their children. <clears throat> you know, they were, you know, the Bible, like we talked about in previous ch uh, chapters, Bible, uh, God called Egypt an iron furnace. You know, it was an inescapable place of destruction. It was fire, it was made of iron, they couldn't get out. If it hadn't been for God, they would have been destroyed. So God's saying, look, don't let this go to your head. That's what he's trying to say here. That's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. He's saying, look, don't let this go to your head. Don't get puffed up about this. You know, and that's a good lesson for us too. Yeah, we're, we are God's people. We've been saved by the blood of Christ. We're peculiar people. We're holy unto the Lord. You know, heaven is our home. We know God. We know the truth. But let's not get this air of you know, arrogance and think about, well, that just makes us better than everyone. Now, it makes us better in the sense that we're saved, but we're still, you know, we're sin we'll ser we're, we're still sinners just like uh, the people we're trying to reach. You know, and we could end up, our lives could end up just as messed up and, 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 and down in the dumps as anybody else's. You know, just because you're saved, that's no guarantee that you know, life's going to turn out great for you. You still have to do your part. But what we're trying to get across is, you know, don't let this go to your head just because you're saved. I mean, it's a great thing to rejoice in, don't get me wrong, isn't it? It's, it's great to sit back and think, wow, I'm saved. And thank God that the knowledge of the truth, that I had an ability to understand and comprehend and know the truth. Praise God for that. But I'm not going to just walk around with my nose 10 feet up in the air and think, well, I'm going to heaven. Where are you going? You know? And I, and I remember I, when I, I was working in uh, excavation, and we were putting a four-inch uh, gas line. We were, running, we were running gas line, and we came around and, uh, across another gas line. And uh, there so all the guys were down there. We had, to, we had to cut this line. We were debating about whether or not to cut. We know, is it alive? Is this a dead line? Is this an old line? Because it wasn't marked. It wasn't there. We thought, well, this is probably just an old gas line. Or then we're like, well, even if it's old, there could still be vapors in there. You know, sh it, w this thing might blow up, we're thinking, right? And I'll never forget. I, sa I said, well, I took the saws all of the guy's hands, and I said, well, I'll cut it because I know where I'm going. <laughs> I said that. <laughs> and I remember just the look on their faces like, okay, jerk, you know. <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought about that. I said, I really did sound like a jerk when I said, well, uh, uh, it's okay if I die today because I know where I'm going, you know. You guys I'm not so sure of, you know. You probably shouldn't cut this line because we all know where you're going, right. <laughs> you know, that's how it came across. And that was kind of a reality check for me. I was like, hey, you can't just, you know, have that kind of an attitude. Don't get puffed up just because you're saved, just because you're God's child. You know what I mean? It's, you know, only uh, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. The only reason you got saved is because somebody showed you 
and the Holy Spirit ministered to your heart and you believed. So we shouldn't have that kind of attitude. Now, um, and, and Paul, you know, like I started out there in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 4, he's a great example of that. You know, of somebody who has the authority to say the things he had to say, but doing it very humbly and doing it very meekly, not being puffed up. And if you would, we'll see more of this if you turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. See, Paul is a, is a great example in Scripture, somebody who has a very, uh, you know, a sober view of himself. He understands the authority that he has, but he also, he's a very meek man. He's a very humble man. But he knows when, to, you know, when and how to put his foot down. And, and when not to, and when to, uh, and, and how to go about, go about doing it. And, and he's not doing it out of a place of being puffed up. You know, he's doing it out of a place of, 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 of God-given authority. It says there in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, look at there in verse 15 where it says, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now, I don't think Paul here is just waxing eloquent, or just trying to put on a woe is me show, or, or you know, trying to make himself, you know, uh, a throw a pity party here. Paul, I really think, will leave that about himself. He said, look, I am chief. Yeah, I mean, he goes on another part, you know, I'm the one who persecuted the church. Right. He talks about you know, all the wicked things that he did, and he was a wicked guy, you know. And he says, how be it, verse 16, for this cause I obtained mercy that in me Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So, yeah, you know, Paul he has a real sober of opinion of himself because here, you know, you, you can see his humility. It's very sober. Yeah, you're right, Paul. You, you were pretty bad. And he says, he shows here in verse 16 his understanding of God's grace. This is the attitude Paul had. He's like, look, the, for I obtained mercy for a purpose that in me, you know, that I could be an example to those that hereafter believe on, uh, would believe on him to life everlasting. You know, Paul knew that God was using him as a model, a pattern to others to say, look, you're, uh, you know, and, and here's the thing. People get real down on themselves sometimes. Like, oh, I could never be saved. I'm so, such a wicked per person. Well, you're not as bad as Paul. Paul was pretty bad. I mean, I'm not trying to badmouth the guy, but when you're, when you're hauling away the saints, when you're touching the Lord's anointed, right. and, you're, and, you're, and you're bringing letters and taking the, 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 the saved save people into prison, and often they're ending up killed. When they're coming and laying your, the clo their clothes at your feet, and then stoning Stephen, the first martyr in the early church. That, you know, you're, you're a wicked guy. You've been, you know, Christ said, you know, it is difficult for thee to kick against the pricks. You know, he was resisting Christ. He was resisting the truth. But God, he has a very sober opinion of himself and a, and a realistic opinion of himself. And he's saying, look, for this cause I obtain mercy that I might uh, be a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He's saying, look, I know God's using me as an example to other people who will come after me. Who will say, oh, I'm too wicked. I'm too bad. Well, you know what? No, we all are. No one, you know, we're all wicked in our heart. You know, the, the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. Now, have you done things as bad as Paul? You know, I, probably not. You know, if, I, if, if we had to, I, I doubt anybody has, to be perfectly honest, in this room. And he understands all this. He has a real sober opinion of himself. He's not puffed up. In, in, in his salvation and what God is using him, the way God is using him. Because he understands God's grace and he understands the end re result, which is that God gets the glory. Look there in verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So he, he has a real sober opinion, doesn't he, of himself. He does not think of himself more highly than he ought to. <coughs> he had his understanding of what's the result. God gets the glor glorification. And, you know, if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, you know, the admonishment we saw in Deuteronomy to Israel and, and, and the example of Paul and, and the grace that was shown to him of God, you know, it all end, has the same result. And, and, and that's the glorification of God. And that's the same for us today. You know, maybe we're, we're sinners. You know, we were hell bound. We're saved. You know, we're not, we should have a very sober, uh, 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 think very soberly, uh, soberly about ourselves. And by all means, we should uh, rejoice in God and our salvation because that is the end, the end result. Just like Paul there, you know, where he sa says, speaks very bluntly about himself and then and gives God glory. You know, it's the same way for us. If you look there in Ephesians chapter 2, look in verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, you know, people always talk about how they, they love, they, you know, 
well, I'm going to go to heaven because I gave my life to Christ. Well, you know, it's he, gave, he loved us. It's not how much about how we love him. It's how much he loved us. Right. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are he saved, and hath raised us up together, and to made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I mean, that's, that's what we are in heaven. We are the example of God's grace and goodness and kindness towards us. And that's always the end result when we think soberly. You know, if we're going to have a sober uh, thing and not let this go to our head, not get puffed up, puffed up or anything, it's, it's going to be because we understand, like, look, none of us are good enough to go to heaven. We're all sinners. And at the end, God gets all the glory for it. But if you would, turn back to Deuteronomy. We'll, we'll move on here. Deuteronomy chapter 7, look at there at verse 8 where it says, uh, be, but because the Lord loved you. You know, he's saying in verse 7, you know, don't think it's because he didn't, he didn't choose you because you were in number than any people, uh, for you were fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. And he says, look, that's why I'm using you. That's why you're holy people. That's why you're peculiar people. That's why I've set you apart. Because I loved you. Uh, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, uh, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. <clears throat> He goes on in verse 9 and says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and his commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face and to destroy them. He will not be, uh, he will not be slack to him that hateth him, but will repay him to his face. So <clears throat> what we get out here in verses 8 and 10 where he says there, uh, he keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments. Now, he doesn't say that he keeps covenant and mercy with, with people who have the right blood flowing through their veins. That's not what he said. He doesn't say he keeps covenant and mercy with people who have the, the right genealogy and can point back to their, you know, their ancestors as being you know, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And you know, this is something that you know, would exact this commandment here in, or this statement here in verse 9 and 10 that would actually exclude modern Israel which is the complete opposite of what you hear today. Oh, they're God's chosen people. Why? Be, uh, because they're Israel. You know, because of their lineage, supposedly. Right? That's what you hear. And a lot of Zionist, uh, uh, Zionism has crept into churches and Christians have swallowed this hook, line, and sinker. Not here. You know, we don't buy that. Because it, and it's not because, you know, we're anti-Semitic. It's because we, we believe the Bible. Yeah, right. Because the Bible says right there in black and white, that God is a God that uh, he's the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him. Right. Does modern day Israel love the God of the Bible? No. Not at all. Not one bit. They certainly don't love Jesus. Right. <laughs> they hate that name. Yep. Anybody who spits after saying the name of Jesus does not love God. Anyone who writes wicked blasphemous things that cannot be repeated from a pulpit does not love God. And they write those things about our Lord. So you have to look at that verse and say, I, I, he keeps covenant mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments. Do they keep the commandments today? No, they don't. They don't. Where, where are the sacrifices? Yeah, right. They don't keep that. You know, they, well, we don't have the altar. Well, you, the Bible says you could make a pile of stones and do it. Yeah. So they don't keep the Old Testament law. And Christians today, they think that they're, that they're just going to get a pass. That, the, well, you're Jewish, you know, you're in. And, you know, and then they say people who would ever preach anything. And go ahead, let's, let's just remind ourselves of this verse. I know we all know this. But let's go over to 1 John chapter 2. Lest the, lest the brainwashing begin to take an effect even on us, right? Because it's, it's, it's everywhere we turn. You know, when you're living in a country that's sending billions of dollars in aid to, that, to the nation of Israel, you know, if there, there's, there's a chance, you know, you might, it might rub up off on some of your thinking. But it says here in first, uh, first John chapter 2, look at uh, verses 22 and 23. <clears throat> he says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. You can't have one without the other. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. So we don't worship the same God. They have another God. And they say, oh, you're, 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 you know, you're anti-Semitic. No, I'm just preaching the Bible. And, you know, the most, and it's such a stupid uh, accusation to throw at uh, our church, you know, whether it's us, us as individuals or our pastor. I hear that one thrown at him all the time. 
Oh, and anti-Semitic. Yet he's probably gone and knocked on more doors of Jewish people and tried to give them the gospel than any of these people that are leveling those accusations. And we were just in South Tempe last night. And it was just Jewish door after Jewish door after Jewish door. And you know, he talked about a sermon. He saw the little, you ever see the little, uh, the little thing they put on their door? The little scroll in it? The little, th you know what I mean? Because the they put like the microfilm in the, in the box and they put it in there. You know, because it, it's just like a, it's like a good luck charm to them or something. You know, because they think they're keeping the law. Y you know, we don't walk up to that and see that, oh, they're Jewish. Well, let's just, you know, right. and just walk away and not knock the door. Not give an opportunity to give the gospel. That would be anti-Semitic. That would be hating the Jews. To just say, oh, they're good. Oh, they, you know, and they're, they're fine. They're, they don't need to hear the gospel. They're, they're already in because, uh, because of their blood. The only thing that's going to get you into heaven is Christ's blood. Yeah, right. Not some lineage that you have. Yep. Just because, uh, <laughs> and I don't want to go off too much on it, but you know, it just reminds me every time whenever you come across these passages, like, look, God is saying right there, if you do not... Uh, love me and keep my commandments, I'm not going to keep my covenant. The covenant is conditional. And you see it all the time in the Old Testament. They stop following God. They stop keeping the commandments. God takes them out of land, destroys them, spreads them out. And then, and then they get right with God. Then they come back in. Then they get, they get out of sorts with God again. God takes them back out. Now, in 1948, did all the Jews get right with God? They didn't. Did they get saved? No, they didn't. They still hate God. They still hate the God of the Bible. They still hate Jesus Christ. They still hate Christianity. But that's not going to stop me or, or anybody that actually loves them from preaching the gospel to them and, try, and wanting to see them get saved. You know, and we've, we've seen Jewish people get saved and, and, and accept Christ as Savior. And, you, know, and you, think, you think, is it really that big a deal? Well, it will be when you actually knock on the, on the, on, on, on the door of a Jew and actually see how, how brainwashed they are. And how lost they are. And how sad it really is. I remember years ago I knocked on a door in South Tempe of all places. Right? And uh, the guy was at the door. I said, he went through my spiel and said, hey, you know, are you 100% sure you're going to go to heaven? And he got this smug look on his face. He said, of course. And he started closing the door real slow. He was like, I'm Jewish. And closed the door. That's what that guy's counting on going to heaven. His blood. Not Christ's. You know, Christ's blood means nothing to him. Now, I don't hate that guy. I thought that was sad. I said, I walked away. I said, that's sad. That guy's going to go to hell because he's rejected the God of the Bible. So we just have to be reminding ourselves because you see it. I mean, when you go through the Old Testament, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's as plain as a nose on your face that, it, that it's not this unconditional uh, covenant that God has with these people that, that they're just in be, that because they're in the club. You, there's only, Jesus said, there is, you know, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way, and it's through Christ. And uh, we'll, we'll continue on here in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7. Where it says there in verse 7, And repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. That should send chills up and down your spine to think that, I mean, it's one thing to make your neighbor mad, you know. And, to get, you know, it's one thing. The Hatfields and the McCoys were one thing, right? When they were out there feuding with one another. It's another thing when God hates you. It's another thing when God's going to be the one that pays you back. Because it's not just going to be, you know, him sneaking over in the night and letting the air out of your tires. You know, it's, it's going to be serious business with God. And, I mean, look at what he's doing to the people of that land that hated him. These filthy nations these, uh, that are doing abominable things. He's repaying them to their, their face, isn't he? He's visiting the iniquity back upon them. But what we really want to learn from this, and if you would, turn to Romans 12. And when you get to Romans, keep something in Romans, because we're going to come back several times tonight. But Romans chapter 12, what I want us to understand, first of all, is that haters deceive, deserve what they got coming. You know, if you hate God, well, you know what? Then you deserve what, got, what you got coming. You know, and I was just talking to uh, Pastor Anderson today, and hopefully I'm not stealing any thunder from a sermon that he might preach, because I said you should preach a sermon about that. But, you know, there's been several people, and, you know, politicians in particular, that have attacked our church, that have, have been outed, and have had God, I believe, repay them to hit their face. You know, we had the minister uh, Gigaba over there in, uh, in Botswana, I believe it was, where he was the one that was responsible for getting, you know, pastor banned from the country and thrown out and all these other, and, you know, and several other people and resisted the work of God. I mean, here a, a group of people are just trying to come in with the Bible and teach people how to go to heaven. Yeah, right. 
And these people are resisting it, fighting against God, and uh, you know, doing his prophets harm, as it were, and they end up getting banned and thrown out. Well, that guy got outed for, you know, I don't really don't want to go into the sordid details of what happened. But let's just say he made a very inappropriate video that got leaked and was blackmailed. And the guy got kicked out of office. And then just today, I passed something about this local politician in Tempe. I don't know exactly what he was, who, uh, you know, had called our landlord and was like, hey, trying to get us kicked out of our building, like imploring our landlord to throw us out, which, you know, Thankfully, we have a, a, a landlord who understands, you know, money talks. <laughs> you know? So he's trying to get us thrown out, and, and, and it doesn't happen, of course, but then that guy gets you know, outed for corruption and everything else. I mean, and, and I'm just, and I'm passing him, and it's like, you've got to preach a sermon on that. You've got some material here. You know, God will repay them to their face. And you know what we should learn from that is that it's better just let God repay your enemies. Yeah, just like, leave it in God's hands. Let him take care of it. Look there in Romans chapter 12. I mean, that's what the, that's what the Bible teaches us to do. Because you know what? When it's God that's repaying it, he's going to do a much better job than you and I ever could. I mean, what, what's the worst that we could do? Look at uh, uh, Romans 12. Look there in verse 18 where it says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So we should strive and desire and work at living peaceably with all men. We should try to get along with our neighbors, people that you know, don't like us even. You know, we should try our best to, to be friendly and kind and, uh, you know, and not to, to, to cause problems. And he says, uh, uh, verse 12, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, and if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome of good, evil of good. So what is he trying to say here? He's trying to say, look, you know, uh, let me take care of it. He says, vengeance is mine. But so often we read it when we want it. You know, the old joke. That we read it. Well, vengeance is fine. No, it doesn't say vengeance is fine. It says vengeance is mine. You know, but we w sometimes we want it the other way. You know, someone does us dirty, you know, and we want to get back at them. Someone's giving us a hard time at work or whatever because of our faith or something like that. And now, and now we just want to lash out. The Bible says, you know what? Overcome evil with good. And let God handle it. You know, because here's the thing, God, you know, God probably doesn't always want to just, you know, come down and, 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 and cloud up on somebody just because, you know, they made some comment at you because of your lifestyle or something or because of your beliefs. God would rather see that person get right with God and get saved. You know, and, and here's the thing, you should overcome evil with good. You'd be nice to that person. Maybe they'll come around, you know. <laughs> and, 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 and let, and if, if, you know, if vengeance has to be taken, leave it up to God. And let him be the one that does it. Because he's way better at it. Now keep something there in Romans and turn back to Deuteronomy. <laughs> and, you know, he, he's kind of leading up to verse 11 with all this. You know, he's telling us about, you know, don't make marriages, don't show them any peace, uh, you know, don't make any covenants with them. You're a holy people. Um, God will repay. You know, love me. Keep my commandments. And he says in verse 11, Thou therefore shalt keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore it shall come to pass if you hearken to, uh, if you hearken, uh, to these judgments and keep them and do them that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant which, and the mercy which he swore unto thy fathers. So again, there's another great verse that shows you it's not... It's not an unconditional covenant that he made with them. It sounds pretty conditional to me, doesn't it? <laughs> if you keep, if, right, if ye hearken yeah, right. to these judgments and keep them and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant mercy which he made the fathers. It sounds like there's some stipulations. There's some prerequisites to keeping that covenant. <clears throat> he goes on and says in uh, verse 13, and will love thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thee. He also blessed the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, and thy corn, and thy wine, and thine oil, and thine increase of thine kind, and the flocks of thy sheep, and the, and the land which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee. And thou shalt be uh, blessed above all people. Therefore there shall not be male or female among you, or among your uh, barren among you, or, your, uh, or among your cattle. And the Lord God will take away uh, from thee all sickness, and will put away the evil, and dise uh, evil diseases from Egypt, which thou uh, knowest upon thee and will lay them upon them all of them that hate thee and thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee uh, thine eyes shall have no pity upon them 
neither shalt thou serve uh, their gods, for he, they will be a snare unto thee. So he, he's saying, look, I'm going to bless you. you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of the people that are going to oppose you. And, but notice in verse 11 where he says, <coughs> it's a therefore. He said, thou therefore. You know, you're going to do this. Why is this all going to happen? Because of, the they, because of the therefore. Because of everything we just read leading up to this. You know, you're going to be keeping God's commandments for these reasons. That's what he's saying there. Therefore. <coughs> so, keeping God's commandments, you know, what it shows us there in that passage is that when we keep them is that it spares you trouble. Right? It spares you a lot of trouble. And I know we've talked about this and, and, I, and I've kind of thought lately, you know, going through this book, I feel like I'm starting to sound like a broken record. You know, obedience, obedience, obedience. It's for your own good. It's for your own good. But you know what? So be it because God's being redundant here. God's repeating the same thing. God's trying to drive in the same message over and over and over. You know, if you'll keep all these commandments, if you do all these things, you know, your, your land's going to be blessed. Uh, you know, you're, you'll, be, you'll be fruitful in your marriages and in your, in your agriculture. You know, God's going to bless you. And God is going to spare you a lot of the trouble that comes with not following Him. So it, the blessing is twofold, isn't it? You don't have to experience all the, the pain, and agony, and woe that the world does, that the heathen does. You know, that in itself is a blessing to not have to have anything to do with all that that comes along with that baggage that comes along with sin and everything. And not only that, but then God also adds a blessing on top of it and says, okay, now you're keeping on commandments. That spared you a lot of heartache in your life, and now I'm going to bless you on top of it. Now I'm going to make your life even better. <coughs> so it's a win-win situation, as we've already talked about uh, in previous sermons when we're going through this. But here's the thing. No one is exempt from this law. You know, and that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, is that we should never have this attitude, you know, we should not be puffed up, that we should think of ourselves soberly, because... We're not exempt from this law of having God punish you know, us. And if you would turn back to Romans chapter 2. And you're just saying, well, I'm saved now. God will never, never punish me. You know, I'm, I'm good to go. I'm never going to have to deal with uh, any, any uh, you know, I can just do whatever I want. There's no consequences now. So look there in Romans chapter 2 in uh, verse 3. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 3, concerning... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm in Romans 1. Romans 2, verse 3, he says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest, thou the, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? I mean, it's one thing to know the commandments of God and say, yeah, these things are right, but I'm going to go ahead and not do them. You know, you judge somebody for something, but you're the one, you know, you're a hypocrite, basically. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impertinent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. You know, getting right, you know, being God, being saved, being God's child, being a, you know, uh, of the house of God does not exclude you from, you know, God judging your works and uh, repaying you according to your deeds. To them who by patient countenance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why? Because verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God. You know, if anything, you know, being a child of God, being one of God's people just makes you more accountable to the things of God. Just means that God's going to expect even more of you because you have learned and known these things. <coughs> So no one is exempt from this, you know, and that's kind of what he, he's getting across here in, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7. He's saying, look, you know, I'm going to bless you, you know, if you keep my covenant, if you keep my commandments. And we see that reiterated in Romans as well, where none of us is exempt from these things. <coughs> but if you would look, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 20. We'll start wrapping this thing up. Deuteronomy chapter 20, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 20. He says in, in verse 20, As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before you, uh, I'm in the wrong place, Deuteronomy chapter 7. He said, Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet uh, among you. I was reading from the wrong chapter earlier, wasn't I? I don't know. I don't can't remember. But he says in, uh, 
Yeah, I think I was. Let's back it up to uh, verse 11. No, you did I get it? Thou therefore shalt... Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he says, okay, let's pick it up in verse uh, 14. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or your, among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thy nine shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. If thou shalt say in thine heart, These nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. The great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs, and the wonders, and the mighty hand, and the stretched out arm, whereby the Lord thy God uh, brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. You know, I'm just reading this, and it just reminds me, you know, how we can bring this kind of into today and apply it in our own lives. Is, you know, we get saved, and we think, well, that's great, but then we have something come up in life, and we think, but God can't help me with that. You know, we come into some obstacle or some difficulty in life and think, yeah, I understand that God, you know, snare, you know, saved me from the fires of hell. I know that God came down and lived a perfect life, in, you know, in Jesus Christ. It was died and buried and rose again and went through all that. And he's willing to have gone and suffered all that for me. You know, the Bible says, he, he that gave us his own son shall he not also freely give us all things. But sometimes we get in our thinking, we start thinking, well, I know God did all that, but, you know, how can I, over he's not going to help me with this. And that's kind of what's going on here. He's saying, look, you know, I've chosen you, and if you start to say, you know, when thou seest the land, these, uh, these, are, these nations that are more than I, how can I dispossess them? You start to doubt whether God's going to be able to do this. He says, remember what I did for you. He says, he takes them back to Egypt and says, remember all the things you saw in Egypt. And, you know, that's the same thing with us in our life, too. When, you know, we come into these difficult situations, we should always remember, well, you know, God, God already did the hardest thing there was for me. You know, lived a perfect life. You know, buried, was buried, suffered three days in hell, and rose again. I'm sure he could help me out in this situation too. I'm sure he's willing to come down and, 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 and give me a hand if you go to him and ask. And that's kind of you know we can make some quick application there, but pick it up there in uh, in verse 20 where he says, "Moreover, uh, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them, until they that are left and uh, and until they that are left and hide themselves from thee shall be destroyed." Well, that stings, right? Yuck, yuck, yuck. He goes on, verse 21. Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee little by little, that thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beast of the field increase upon thee. I mean, look at how careful God is being with them. He's even saying, look, you're going to dispossess them, but not all at once, in case the beast of the field come up. You know, God didn't want to have them to even contend with you know, the lions and the tigers and the bears, right? Oh, my. But uh, he goes on in verse 23 and says, But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee and destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. And he shall deliver thy kings into thine hand and shall destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them. So he's showing him here in these verses that the greatest to the least, right, of these people were no match for them because of God, because of who their God was. It didn't matter, like it says there in verse 24, it, it, or excuse me, in, uh, it, we'll just look at it, verse 24, you know, the, the kings. He says, and he shall deliver their kings into their hands. Right? Even the, the greatest among them, the top brass, shall not be able to. And that's exactly what we see happen in Joshua, if you recall the story. He destroys those five kings, right? In Joshua chapter 10, God, and God, God fights for them. Causes the sun to stand still, and they, they chased him. And then they were weary, and God sends hailstones. And the Bible says more men died from the hailstones that God sent than the armies that, uh, of Joshua. God killed more people than, than Joshua did that day. And he killed those kings. So these kings weren't even going to be able to stand before them. And he says in verse 22, and the people of the land. You know, you got the, the, the greatest, of just the people of the land. You know, they, they were not going to be able to, uh, to stand before them. But what's really great is verse 21. Where it says, where he says, he, you know, thou shalt not be afraid of them, uh, for the Lord thy my God is a mighty God, a mighty God, a terrible. I'm sorry, verse 20. More of the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them. Now notice when he sends the hornet among them until they that are left. So this is actually, you know, something God was doing at the end, right? Until they that are left, after they had gone in and begun to destroy them. 
you know, because it's if they that are left and hide themselves from thee. So he sends the hornet not, you know, right at the beginning, but it's even when the, the people start to realize, okay, we can't, you know, we're defeated, we can't win, so they scatter, they start to hide. God doesn't let them go and hide. God doesn't let them just like, oh, they've dispersed, you know, they're not going to be in trouble. God sends the hornet after them. I mean, the lean, the greatest to the least, the king all the way to the guy that's cowering in some bush somewhere, God's going to fight against those enemies. There's nobody that's going to be able to stand uh, before them. And when you read this, you know, so much of this makes me think about revelations, the things we read there, right? God's going to send the hailstones, you know, you got the hornets right here, and then you got, in, in Revelation, you got, you know, the, 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 those beasts that he describes with, you know, the, the hair of a woman, the face of a man, the teeth like lion, and the tails of a scorpion, and it's given unto the power of them to, to torment men, and they shall wish to die, and death shall escape them. I mean, God is tormenting all these people. And, you know, really, this should be an encouragement, you know, to anyone that actually might see that tribulation. I mean, that's a sobering thought. You know, you're writing this. I was writing this and thinking, you know, sometimes we forget there's going to be a generation that sees the tribulation, whether it's ours or the next or our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren. There's going to be a generation that comes up and has to face all these things, face the Antichrist and the one world government and, and, and everything that comes along with it and the persecution, you know, they should look to this story and be encouraged and reminded that, you know, God, if God fights for you, you know, if, if God be for us, who then can be against us? You know, and we could go to Romans 8, we won't for the sake of time, but, you know, the Bible makes it real clear in Romans 8, there's nothing that's going to separate us from the love of Christ. You know, persecutions, afflictions, death, nothing. So that's kind of what he's trying to do, right? He's trying to encourage them and say, look, I'm fighting for you. I don't care if it's the king. I don't care if it's some coward that's turning his tail and running. I'm going to get him. You know, and that's an encouragement that we could have. If we end up being that generation, you know, where maybe we're the ones that are, you know, are, are being persecuted, just remember that, you know, God's going to pay them to their face. God takes vengeance. But notice here in verse 25 and 26, you know, God, you know, promises them all these blessings. God says, I'm going to fight for you. And, and you know, he, he's going he's gonna to do all these great things for them. But in verse uh, 25, he says, The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be, uh, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination, O Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou, bring, uh, 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 shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it, but thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. So God here at the end, you know, God, this whole chapter is telling about all the great things he'll do for them, all the battles he'll fight for them, all the blessings he's willing to bring upon, on, upon them. But what's he saying here at the end? That he wants the credit that's doing. He's saying, look, don't bring these abominations in. Don't let, don't let them turn your heart from me. Because God expects and he deserves the credit that it, that's due him. You know, and that's the same thing in our, in our own lives. You know, we should make sure that we're giving God the glory that we should. That we're never letting something take the place of God in our life after he's done so many things for us. And, after, you know, and, and because he's willing to do so much more, because there's so many things, that, you know, blessings that God is willing to bestow upon us in our lives. You know, we should not be letting other things take his place. We shouldn't, you know, you're not bringing it into our house or probably bringing it into our life. You know, he says, don't bring these things in your house. You know, we shouldn't be allowing things come into our own lives that are going to steal the glory from God. Why? Because he deserves the glory. He's earned it. He's worthy of it. Thou art worthy to be praised, God. So, and here's the thing, you know, if we did that, you know, if we did something, if we let these things become a snare to us, we could just easily end up on the wrong end of God's vengeance. And we could just, I'm not saying we're going to lose our salvation, but, you know, we might kindle the wrath of God. And now we're sitting here having to take some of these punishments. And we certainly don't want any of that. But, you know, just to kind of summarize and conclude the sermon here, you know, what did we learn tonight? We learned several things. There are several things in this passage that we can learn from. You know, one, we should not be consorting with the heathen. You know, our most closest and intimate relationships should not be with the unsaved. And, you know, you find that, again, in First Peter, you can read about that. But we shouldn't let that puff us up. You know, why should we be consorting with them? Because we are a peculiar people. We are a holy nation. We are lively stones. We are, we are a royal priesthood, the Bible says in First Peter. But we shouldn't let that puff us up either. No, we shouldn't be consorting with them, you know, and making leagues with them. But we shouldn't also let that puff us up and think, well, it's because we're better than them. It's because of the fact that God knows it'll be a snare unto us and bring us, draw us away from him. 
and he deserves that. You know, God's bless. What else we learn that God's blessing and cursing is determined by our keeping and rejecting His word. You know, you want to be blessed of God in your life, or you want to be cursed. What's well, all based upon how you handle the word of God? What role it's going to play in your life? How obedient you are to it? And it's not by, as we saw, some you know supposed bloodline. It's not your hereditary. You're, you're in the club or something. So <clears throat> really, you know. What do we need to do with this sermon? We need to learn to obey God, you know, and let him bless us. Let him understand that he's there to defend us, to help us out. You know, God in your life can either be one of two things. God can either be your greatest ally or your fiercest foe in life. You know, and it's really up to us whether which which side of God we're going to get. We're going to get the ally or we're going to get, you know, the enemy. You know, I'll take the ally. You know, and that's all determined by our obedience to God's word. Let's go ahead and pray.